Good morning, good morning, congratulations. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. We want to thank the Friends of San Diego for the invitation. It's the Friends of San Diego Architecture. It's, uh, it's great to be here with everyone. Uh, thank you for making the effort to come out so early on a Saturday. Uh, our lecture is called Dual Perspectives. The, 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 the lecture is uh, focused on practicing on both sides of the border. When Catherine approached us about talking uh, and giving this lecture, she was interested in the, in the fact that we had won awards on both sides of the border for the projects, one in Tijuana and one in Lone Pine, California. So uh, this was the, uh, uh, this is our, our uh, to, to kind of describe the, the, the navigation of you know, practicing on both sides, we're primarily based in San Diego have some projects in, in Tijuana, but we're also uh, very interested in exploring how we can still uh, partner with fabricators and, and uh, subcontractors in Tijuana to build projects in the region. Uh, this slide just has a little sampling of some of our work um, over the last you know, for years, we've kind of grown our body of work to be a little more centered around public spaces. Uh, you could say generally commercial, commercial uh, oriented. Um, we started off with, you know, one of our first commissions was a brewery, which is actually a space where people gather and it's a very social space. Um, we went on to uh, work with a lot of retail, uh, on, uh, on a lot of retail projects. Um, so in a sense, you could say that that's where grow in our niche is uh, developing spaces that uh, we like to say is that you know, there are spaces that, that bring together people. Uh, we do also do some multifamily and residential, um, but a lot of our work, you know, pretty much all of our work has been, uh, we don't have you know, set, uh, an individual kind of style per se, a lot of our work is very you know, context driven, driven by the site, by the needs, and uh, in, in a way, you know, it's kind of developed a, a style, I guess you could say. Um, but as Carlos said, we didn't set out to become a cross-border practice. I think we've just evolved over the years. Um, and moving down from Los Angeles to San Diego just to kind of explore the opportunities down here. Um, we were led down here by initially by a project in Tijuana. And um, I think it's now led us to explore how we can um, not only build in Tijuana, but the ways we can collaborate on both sides of the border and the way we can make you know, projects a lot more interesting, more cost effective, um, better spaces for people by using the resources we have here in San Diego and Tijuana. So obviously the uh, more and more, at least in my experience uh, growing up, navigating the border, I, I, mean, I was crossing the border every day to go to school, uh, it never really felt like uh, San Diego to what I didn't feel like a region too much uh, for me back then. It felt like the border was very kind of present, but at the same time it was permeable. So I was always kind of navigating it in and out. Uh, but it's very exciting to see, you know, in the recent years, how much uh, the connection has grown. Obviously, Tijuana and San Diego uh, shared many resources. Uh, and, uh, you know, Tijuana has been uh, subsidized housing, so we should return the aid for some time. And, and Tijuana provides a, a huge workforce that so never crosses hundreds of thousands of people that come across the border. And there's a lot of influences. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of exchange of, 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 of ideas, and culture, and cuisine, uh, and uh, more and more, and technology. And the, now, with, you know, with things being, it's, it's hard to source things from China, so you see a lot more of this new showing that's happening nowadays. So it's a really fascinating time. And we're very interested in how uh, you know, the construction industry can capitalize on this. So the first project we're going to talk about briefly is uh, Interpenta Brewery. This was a uh, uh, commission that started in 2000. Actually, we started talking about it in 2013 uh, with the owners. Uh, this is Ivan Morales and Damian Morales. They were brewing beer uh, behind a uh, office building in. in Zona Rio District in Tijuana. Uh, they 
Baja California has become the leader in, in, in Mexico for craft brewing because of its proximity to San Diego. A lot of these brewers source their ingredients from San Diego, so they buy their hops. Uh, and uh, with, the, with the growth of uh, the demand of the craft brewing scene, it's a hit they needed to grow. So they had a lot in the Zona Rio district uh, where there's a lot of offices and uh, not, a, you know, not a typical industrial use. But uh, you know there, there there is a bit of uh, you know, some some retail uh, sale, but it, but it's more kind of medical devices and things like that that are surrounding the area. There's a there's a hospital not too far away from the site, so the zoning in Tijuana is a bit uh, you know yeah kind of flexible sometimes. But yeah, that, I guess the critical thing for for them was the the, the separation to the hospital, um, and so. Uh, you know, brewing doesn't really generate a lot of you know, contaminants or smoke or anything. It's pretty self-contained. Um, so we went ahead and started designing a space that would be that would really incorporate uh, the brew the, the brewing process with the community. We really wanted to kind of bring people in and, and have them experience uh, the brewing process while they're enjoying the brewing. These are just some of our first very, very early sketches when we were exploring uh, the typologies of how this brewery can be put together. And um, like Carlos said, the, the main factor on this project is how can we bring people into the, um, completely envelop them in the process of, of beer making and have them really experience it that way. Not only when they're, they're te as they're tasting it, they're seeing how it's made, they're seeing it brewed, they're seeing it taken from the mash tun into the fermenter and back and forth and into the different tanks uh, to then become the final product. And it's really just part of the experience. So um, we had a limitation of a very small site. This is uh, the owner's, uh, it was a family owned land uh, next to the, the, this building that they already owned. And so we had to kind of create this very tight vertical space for them to create their, their flagship brewing space, so to speak. Um, as we knew you know, later down the road, it was they quickly outgrew it because you know they were just a super fast developing brewery. But um, we had the challenge of creating um, we created these two two masses or two volumes to the left and the right. Uh, one was for back of house spaces and kind of like the gray area, and then uh, the other side is a storage area for all the beer. And then uh, basically these two separate the cross of the the beer making side versus the public side, and in the middle is where that kind of um, uh, the, the kind of visibility happens, you get to experience it. There's a second mezzanine level uh, on the uh, second floor, and this is also another tap room space. Um, and everyone can sit along the edges of this balcony and look down onto the into the brewery and watch the brewers do their magic. Um, so I guess this, that's sort of the you know the, uh, the diagram per se. Then on the third floor, we. Uh, we wanted them, we always knew that this needs to have a beer garden. Uh, Tijuana doesn't really have, and it still doesn't, I don't think to this day, it doesn't really have too many beer garden spaces, and especially terraces that allow people to see their city. So this was kind of unique because it was one of those first kind of gathering spaces or, or, or beer gardens where people would get to, uh, you know, sit up there and really see all of the activity and all the construction uh, going on in the growth of the city. Uh, it was a, sort of a way of kind of um, observing that, and I think it really connected people to, back to the urbanism happening around them. So in a way, I think this is a this is a great way to, to kind of create more of a sense of pride, um, sense of connection for people. You, know, you don't want to just create a room that's pretty on the inside and have it insular, um, but we really wanted to branch out from that and have people to uh, look out further beyond that. I was speaking a little bit about the construction. Uh, it's interesting because you know we were trained formally here in the United States. We were you know getting licensed in California, and when we had when we had the challenge of you know developing this, this brewery in Mexico, the, the types of construction, obviously the, the standard types of construction are a little bit different. You know we don't see so much wood frames construction or even metal framed. Everything's you know a lot of things tend to be more of concrete block and steel, uh, which. To us, you know, it seems you know a lot more long-lasting. Um, but inadvertently, we created 
a type one building, just because that was what the normal construction type was. Is everything you know tends to be CMU and concrete and steel. Uh, so that's what we did, and that was the first uh, steel building we ever um, uh, really kind of erected uh, or were commissioned to do. And with the, also you know, the training of, that we have here, a lot of the layout and the plan, the floor plan was you know, very ample. We, we kind of already provided this, this space that you normally would for you know, wheelchairs and, and, and comfortable spaces to get in and out of restrooms and hallways and, and stairways. And I think that was one of the first things that kind of set this apart that people really noticed was, wow, I think these stairs are really generous. Uh, the hallways are really generous because a lot of times if you want to like every, a lot of construction is just done to the bare minimum. The codes aren't, um, you know, the limitations of, of codes don't exist in Tijuana, which you, know, you could say it does allow more creativity, but at the same time, um, it does, uh, you know, people want to get the bang for their buck and uh, it kind of gets lost. So that was one thing that, you know, bringing that kind of uh, standardization of design was, um, we were able to do it, but we did it without even thinking about it, without, you know, no one's asking us to do it, but it created a, a much better space along with the, the freedom to you know have a lot of design creativity. In, in doing the construction documents, it was also interesting because we had to do a set of provide a set of plans to a contractor in Mexico. This was the first time we were doing this. Um, we all were both native Spanish speakers, but you know, getting to learn a lot of the lingo and, and, and construction was uh, a little bit of a learning curve. And we developed our first set of plans that had uh, all the dimension strings in feet and inches as well as in the metric system. So all the dimension strings had both the, the, uh, both measurements, um, one, on, one on the top and the other on the bottom. It's very interesting that Barbara said you know, the, the, you know, the terminology and construction is different, so some of these words are kind of very specific, right? So, uh, you know, this was, we bought a few uh, you know, <laughs> construction detailing books in Spanish and kind of, you know, just kind of let them a little bit and figure it out because, uh, you know, we, we, uh, there wasn't like a, an easy translator sometimes for that available. So yeah, we, uh, it was interesting, but uh, yeah, and apart from, you know, this was our attempt to really try to control the quality of the construction uh, because, you know, it's, you gotta cross the border to go see, check on it and stuff, but at the same time, there was a lot of like uh, improvisation, right? So we would always improvise, so, and, uh, you know, we'd be there at site and we would just kind of start sketching things out and try to figure Figure details out of like how we can make you know solutions on the fly. Uh, this was actually this was a this is meant to be a car stop right in front of the storefront opening. We had these uh, I beams acting as car stops, and it's just one of those things where in Mexico a lot of things, uh, a lot of projects are developed only into DV or design development, and then basically construction documents are figured out on the site in construction, and I think that allows them to also you know, start start constructing sooner and um, I think there's this sort of trust and also you know architects are the builders as well so it's already inherently design built but um, we had to kind of create this detail we created it with the, 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 uh, the metal workers on the fly and created this detail to create this planter that doesn't look like a car stop but it's, it's something that uh, adds a little bit more of an aesthetic appeal to the entrance and uh, you don't really notice it with the car stop there was, a, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of this sort of improvisation there, like improvising, just trying to figure things out as we went. Um, we weren't too concerned about, you know, like just, you know, this window needs to move over, you know, being out and things like that. We were just, you know, trying to, because, uh, you know, during construction things change and, and we're trying to control things, but at the same time, we, you know, we, we, we had a bigger picture in mind and also just like, you know, the, how we could really engage the community and bring people together in, in this space. Um, and, and just being more loose about it, you know? So there's, there's this quality of sometimes of imperfection, but it's, we, we, we like that. Um, there's also the need to bring in a lot of natural light. Uh, we, we were struggling with that because we're like, well, we want to have a roof garden, but we want to have a lot of natural light in it. So what can we do? How can we combine these two things? Um, and before I stick to that next slide, I just want to point out how you can you know, look over to the brewery there, and then as you're coming up the stairs, it's, so as you're walking around the brewery, you're always kind of being able to look at the implementation of the tanks and the things like that. 
So yeah, when we were thinking about the skylights, we were like, well, let's pop the skylights up and just make those little bars. So now we see the little round tables that are there. Those are actually places where people can sit, uh, drink free beer, and also look into the brewery. So uh, the idea was to, to have uh, uh, some space for seating, but also be able to uh, provide a lot of natural light. And this is some of the views that Barbara's talking about. If you want to go through a lot of you know, vertical construction right now, there's, there's so much construction happening uh, for housing. Mainly housing, I mean, there is office, but, but I think housing is a big thing, uh, especially with you know, just the cost of living here now. So uh, it's really fascinating to sit here. And we don't go that often, but when we go, we always see the blue crane. Uh, so this looks totally different. There's probably like two more buildings. In order to, to get this work uh, built, we actually were not licensed in Mexico, which we could, but we have got to that. We could check that box, but we worked with the licensed architect in Tijuana in order to, you know, they were actually the architects of record. So we basically put this up to a, you know, a light construction document or a very developed TV to design it all on set, and then worked with the architects of record uh, local, locally, uh, and they helped us with the permitting process, which very fast, a lot simpler than here. And uh, they also provided the structural engineer. So we um, worked back and forth and MEP. So that was uh, kind of our first go at working with uh, an architect here and collaborating and you know, translating of dimensions and models and information that kind of back and forth coordination um, it was the first time. But it wasn't, you know, anything. Um, you know, we were able to, to share our 3D model, uh, and it's basically, you know, this, it was amazing how this came up exactly like our 3D model and all of ours have been modeling, uh, which is just great to see. So the next project, uh, this one's uh, Sage and Fire in Lopa. Uh, Lopa is a really um, uh, kind of very quiet uh, western town. This one, this one. Yeah, the, uh, the, the landscape is quite beautiful. You know, you got the, uh, it's this town that's on the way to, uh, to Mammoth. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a very, uh, it has a you know, kind of Western, very known for, for Western film, uh, as a Western film set. And uh, we, we were commissioned to design a, a refill for it uh, behind a gas station. It's this. It, it's an existing building that was used as a storage shed. It's quite tall, actually. That's a door. It's an entry door, so this is like probably the door that was used for the other side of the view there. Uh, and it has a, a beautiful backdrop of the the mountains there. Uh, and so we, whatever you propose there in terms of modifying anything, it's you know, although it was a shed, I mean, it had to go through this kind of really stringent uh, planning review. Uh, they have very specific palette of materials that they want you to use with it being like this western town. So uh, they, they wanted wood, they wanted stone, they would allow, uh, you know, rusted metal, they would allow um, uh, adobe, things of, that, things of that, of that nature. And so uh, we, we started working on the design. Uh, we found a local structural engineer that we could work with over there. There wasn't that many, uh, but we wanted someone that could be on the ground because it was so far away from us, it's four hours away. So this is the first draw, this is the drawing set that he sent me to submit to the city, and I was like, oh. I was really worried, I was like, oh man, should I redraft this? Or, because, you know, and, and the little section uh, thing moves around too, so you can, <laughs> you can pick where you want to cut. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was, uh, it was a low, low, low tech thing. Uh, but, um, yeah, so basically the, 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 the big move with the project was to have this kind of vernacular barn look, you know, because the shed is, uh, you know, has a, the, the, the beer theme, and, and we were trying to just kind of accentuate that and maybe extend extend, extend the framing out so it's, it's framed with trusses, so that there you can see the, uh, the extension that we proposed. Um, and uh, yeah, so we submitted this. Uh, I actually asked him to, well, 
he sent me a, a, a scan drawing that this is, he sent me first the picture, but I just asked him to, he was going to sign it, and he said, so yeah. Um, and uh, yes, actually, the, 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 the building was divided into backup house and retail at the front. Uh, it's, uh, you know, pretty, pretty tight spaces, but you know, bathrooms, uh, uh, office space, and storage, and uh, the retail floor. Uh, there you can see the, the section where we sort of elongated the, uh, the overhang to uh, kind of accentuate this more kind of bottom look, but also um, create some, some, some shading at the entrance. And then we got into more of the, we were really into using, uh, of the materials that were available to us, we were really interested in using a, a, a core tin, uh, corrugated metal that would, that would patina and rust uh, throughout uh, time. So uh, we, we started with a corrugated metal that had a very uh, metallic look, and then it, it started to rust into this beautiful, you know, kind of brown uh, orange color. Um, and, and it's really nice to see the contrast between the, you know, the mountains, uh, you know, the white of the mountains, and then, and then it's actually really interesting in the earth. This, this area just changes so much. And then you have this, this season where it's very green around here with all the rain. So it's, it's, it's very, uh, there's a lot of contrast in terms of the, the context. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's this. Transparency, but not, not, not fully uh, uh, opaque. So just like like we did, they kind of cut it on the stairs with the purple, and then it just went more with these kind of um, two by two by four tubes to the end. We obviously think in low pine, we use pine for the infilling um, to make it warm and cabin like. Some of the texture. Like we get this really good, you know, big sky. There's just so much, so much in this landscape. We've been working on another project uh, for uh, this one is in currently permitting. Uh, it's a project in City Heights. Uh, the, the the site abuts the Manzanita Canyon. It's sort of where it terminates. Manzanita Canyon Trail. Um, it's an exist well. It's an existing prefabricated metal building. Uh, we've worked with prefabricated metal buildings before, uh, but we're very interested in how you can modify those systems and uh, uh, you know customize them. Uh, this one, we, we, the, the idea is to keep the building, keep the structure, but we skin it and add add an additional building adjacent to it. Uh, there, you can see the uh, kind of the current interpretation of the, of the design, the, the, the lower building is the existing building. We added a, a bay of, of, of uh, a roofed area where you can sit outside and enjoy your bread and kind of enjoy the, the breeze of the man. That's the canyon is right across the street there. Um, and then you have the taller volume that is uh, part of the cafe and bake bar, but um, behind that is more of the kitchen and the sourdough production facility. So I don't know if anyone knows uh, Isola, who, which used to be in this building. Uh, they are now, uh, they just relocated and reopened in, um, on, on Island Avenue. But this would be their, essentially this is their kind of future look ahead of the, this is the future of their company, future of production for them. This is going to be their, their sort of flagship um, or, or head, headquarters. They would be basically producing the majority of their bread out of this space. And the plan for them is, you know, they would be able to ship out bread or car baked bread to either local bakeries or maybe other retail outlets of theirs. 
um, but this is sort of you know, their long-term plan, and so they wanted to make sure that this can accommodate all of that expansion. The owner purchased that building, um, the existing building. It was not going to be large enough, so uh, it was actually been made by Star Buildings. They've been around for many, many years, and they still are, are um, in operation today. So um, we, we knew from the get-go that any addition would also be made out of prefabricated uh, metal elements. Um, so this, this core plan pretty much outlines, it's kind of divided into two sides. The, the bottom half has, uh, they primarily break sourdough and croissants. That's their specialty. So the bottom half essentially is their sourdough production. And the sort of upper side is their croissant production. And they have very different processes, very different kind of temperature control for both types of dough uh, and different machinery. So um, you do have some areas that, that overlap, but essentially it's, it's basically divided into that. And then the whole left side of the building is the public interface, which has um, an eatery, uh, a big bar, um, a, a little area where you know, there can be sort of um, you know, live music and things like that. Uh, and then there's also a mezzanine level as you go up. Um, so yeah, that's the whole the whole left side of that elevation. That's the new addition. And, and this building is um, we, kept, we kept a lot of uh, we incorporated a lot of sustainable measures into it. This is a building that incorporates a lot of natural light. We created a, a, a canted roof to allow a lot of. Um, uh, the players are windows to, to just allow as, as much natural light as possible without overheating the inside. Um, we have uh, very large overhangs. Uh, the roof the roof system does have uh, contain water collection as well as bioswells in the landscape. Um, and, and in general, it's, it's a building that would be that would use very little uh, HVAC to cool it with the use of the operable windows that the building will have, and then. Uh, you know, a lot of skylights and, and uh, the ability to let the light, natural light come in. Um, you can see again here the left, the right side is right, so this is the, yeah, so existing buildings on the right hand side, the, the new addition is on the left hand side. In working with the SAR building systems uh, to customize this building, generally it's uh, instead of you know, the, the addition, we, we basically didn't have a ridge, we just made it a single slope roof. Started to really add up in cost uh, to modify and customize it. So this is where we kind of started to bring in the idea of uh, working with some of our steel subs in Tijuana to uh, fabricate uh, the, the columns and the, all, all the steel basically for the building. Um, we've, we've been uh, working with EMP Steel, who is a licensed sub in California, but they have a huge production facility in Tijuana and they fabricate all structural steel. So it's quite fascinating when you go to their shop, they're churning out, you know, massive stairs. Uh, you know, the size of this room, like half of this room, like, where are these going? And they're like, oh, they're going to the airport. They're the back of house stairs for Terminal 1 here in San Diego. So there's just so much of that that you know, we weren't aware of. Um, and, and, um, and that's the same people that we work, uh, you know, the construction of the, that we designed the pavilion with and fabricated the Just some of the studies, you know, looking at different roof lines uh, for the addition and have this factory look but still maintain uh, you know, have something that's easily framed. It's a side plan with the existing metal building and the new, the new, the new metal building, but it might not be pre engineered anymore. It's, it's going to be probably custom, uh, custom metal building. Uh, one of the, uh, the measures that we've been implementing into this project that were uh, that are sustainable, you know, the, the roof structure that would be ready for the foils of big panels, um, uh, a sky deck, uh, water collection, south facing terrace windows, um, and in our a lot of our projects we've now been implementing because we work in Revit, which we've been in BIM for basically uh, our whole you know since the start of the firm. In Revit, there are a lot more tools now to allow uh, analysis of the sustainability of buildings in order to, uh, you know, our, our, the things that we're interested in is reducing carbon emissions, um, trying to make buildings as net zero as possible. Uh, we use an app called, or a plugin called Tally. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there for Revit that allow you to just, you know, hit a few buttons, you enter some data, 
and it'll do an analysis based on the materials and how much is existing versus versus new construction. And in this building, I mean, this is also you know it, it's a, an approach that we work a lot with. We work a lot with existing buildings, and that is probably you know one of the most sustainable ways to to do construction now is to reuse existing buildings that already have been developed. Um, you know, and so that that takes the existing building into consideration when it runs the analysis, and uh, it produces an overall you know, net lower carbon emission overall and that helps offset you know the, the use of you know the steel that we have uh, you know steel, steel is known to not be such a, uh, a carbon friendly material um, it is 100 percent almost 100 percent recyclable and the majority of the steel that we use is already pre-recycled so that helps offset that um, and so we've been using and implementing that in a lot of our new projects and, uh, and that, analyzing the actual um the carbon and Emissions as well as other items. Some axonometrics and some red rings. Uh, going into so for our, the exchange pavilion, uh, this is just our, our most recent completed project. It's been up for a month, four weeks. This was <coughs> leading up to. The, uh, the, the construction of this. This is our first uh, design, true design build project where we designed and also had hand in the construction or the, 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 the general contracting of the project. Um, this was basically, it, it's been a culmination of so much effort from both sides of the border. And the interesting thing is we're trying to highlight the cross border collaboration of our, of our dual cities. And this, this project embodied it completely in, in the way we designed it, engineered it, and then fabricated it, and even transported it across the border. So, uh, we initially submitted for the Low Design Capital RFP to design the pavilion back in November. Uh, we were uh, asked to resubmit with a binational team. So they wanted a binational team that could work together to design uh, the pavilion. Uh, so we were based in San Diego, so we were thinking, who can we team up with that would you know, be a good fit for us? And we thought about Daniel Ranova, who's a, a, a very prolific artist at the, along the border. Uh, Internationally known, he's been you know, working um, for many years in, in our region, and we were particularly interested in the the sculptural work that he does. We were really fascinated with some of the metals, like the, the, he uses metal stud, uh, like light gauge steel, to make these beautiful sculptures, and he he gets a really good effect from like a very kind of simple material. So like, we were really interested in like that idea of like creating the extraordinary with the ordinary, you know. And, Using the ornament to create the extraordinary. Uh, with our limited budget, we we had to uh, be, be uh, resourceful, and so uh, we had a lot of conversations with Daniel and we tried to identify what what made this region, you know, uh, identify our iconic parts of the border, things that stand out to us. And obviously, we we thought about the border because it's something that's uh, so present uh, here. And, the further you get away from the border, it, it, it gets bigger. But for us, uh, you know, it's it's something that we that we navigate day in and day out. So we, we thought to ourselves, well, what an interesting idea we could you know, take the border wall and, and, and use that for the design of the pavilion. Uh, we looked at the, the, the border wall as it exists along the uh, you know, playas and, and uh, Tijuana. There's two walls. There's the old wall and then there's the new wall. And then there's a no man's land that sits in the middle. Where you know border patrol circulated, so we kind of took those two points and, and, and by you know said why don't we uh, create uh, you know a, a space in this no man's land? So we took the border walls and we essentially just pinched them together, and by doing that, it kind of lifts up like a veil, and it invites people on both sides to come in and, and you know conceptually be in this in this no man's land. So what was previously a no man's land is now a space for the community uh, of our region. 
So in developing, uh, you know, there was a lot of work and uh, research and, and, and findings that we, we had a whole process that we went through in order to come up with that final move or the final kind of uh, the statement of the two walls. Um, you know, we began obviously by looking at how we began as this this cross this border town or this binational region. Um, you know, going all the way back through even uh, when it was just indigenous indigenous population. And, Spanish coming to Southern California, the missionaries. Um, but we always knew, you know, San Diego Tijuana always had, and currently now, the main word that came up to us was exchange. Um, we have this, every day, there's the population the size of a small town crosses the border, either north or southbound, uh, both ways. So that is something that we could not ignore. You know, it's, it's a massive movement of people, of labor, of uh, materials, goods, Transactions, economic transactions, um, trade, uh, technology, everything from even, even electronics. You know, there are so many electronics that are trafficking south of the border. And so that led to, you know, how can we need to kind of explore that word exchange, the letter X, uh, and just being a crossroads. So, uh, you know, starting with these very simplified part D diagrams of, of uh, looking at a crossroads of culture, technology, arts, people. How does that all come together? Um, we always had this notion of, you know, even if we often it was actually with an excellent plan. I don't know if you know whether or not that was experienced by people, but an excellent plan was always something that we, we developed. And with Daniel, he's uh, in this photo, this was our team photo right after we interviewed the first time with Global Design Capital. And we kind of just really uh, embody the sense of this team and the exchange from the get go, <laughs> even before being selected. And with that exchange, we always kind of had this duality in mind of, you know, San Diego and Tijuana, they're very opposites, but also very together. The idea of the coherent and the incoherent, or chaos and order, um, which is evident in everyday life here in the border, from, you know, the constant crossing of people and kind of the ad hoc nature of that. And it's a very chaotic life we have here, but they, they flow, they kind of work together. Anything from, you know, the, the way uh, you know, immigration um, and, and trade and business, the economy, we want to kind of explore that in these visual elements. And so we're looking at uh, structures that have this order, yet um, you know, kind of create this the incoherentness of that, creates an order. So these are just some very, you know, conceptual studies that Daniel was uh, looking at along with us, you know, in a twisted metal studs and uh, you know, starting from the bottom with a very structured, rigid uh, framing, and then at the top it just becomes a chaotic mess. Just very uh, exploratory kind of ideas. We came, quickly found out that, you know, with the demand of what we were trying to design and the magnitude of the, of the structure, you know, the, the fact that it had to, that we wanted it to span and, and uh, have no columns and, and be able to assemble and disassemble, you know, we, you know, we, we came to the realization that light-gate steel would not be the right way to go. Um, and so we, we, we ended up switching to that more uh, robust uh, tube steel. Um, and uh, before I switch to the slide, the, the, this is a font that is on the ticker tape of the pavilion that was custom designed for the pavilion. If you fill in, the, 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 the font fills in and it makes an X with a box around it. And part of the, the, the idea with it being uh, this, this frame that this assembles, we wanted Every part of the pavilion would be also kind of a show or, or, or an event. So we looked a lot at you know, different uh, installations like the uh, levitated mass uh, installation by Michael Heisner in Blackmont and the, uh, the Endeavor application uh, to LA. We were just uh, very, just very fascinated by the idea of like this, you know, this massive thing moving. We started to romanticize about the idea of this, this structure, you know, crossing the border uh, in these, you know, this oversized structure with, with pilot cars moving its way through the border and into the whole park. Looking at also creating that form that we now have, the, uh, the essential idea was also trying to create, uh, taking the vertical plane, which is the border, how can we take that wall and merge it with a roof plane, so vertical to horizontal plane. These are just kind of like the very initial sketches of how we, we try to come up with that form so you can see, you know, in section of a wall plane kind of 
walking or joining with the, with the roof plane and then study how we can multiply that, near it, rotate it to create an actual structure. So our the requirements for the pavilion were that it needs to be a space for gathering that the public can, can actually gather in. It needs to have um, something interactive, some digital and, and some technology, and it needs to kind of spark spark wonder, spark uh, curiosity. So you know these were challenging requirements, but uh, at the end of the day, you know we still need to have a space. Like, what is the actual space where people can gather? It was going to have would need a substantial span, and so that's how we end up with a final sort of layout here. And this is the floor plan. It's not a symmetric, perfectly symmetrical piece, as you might notice. It's actually um, we did actually you know initially have it as a symmetrical geometry where the arch, the, the sides that are arched up, they were right in the middle, and then we started to explore, you know, we don't want this to be this perfect piece. We want it to kind of feel warped as if it was crushed together by brute force to create this roof plane. So just by a simple offsetting of that arch, we then uh, mirrored it and rotated the other half to create what some people, you know, it looks like, might even look like a roller coaster from some sides or something like that. Um, it has a different personality in each angle, you know, it doesn't have this perfect symmetry, it's not a, a perfect object. So um, some sides are dipped lower than others. Uh, this is the, the framing plan from above, and you can see how in the challenge, you know, to transport this across the border and to make this a portable installation, that's something that can be taken apart and reassembled again. We had to break it down into eight individual frames, um, and you can see I don't know if you can see where there's a, a double structural member. Those are where, that's where each joint, uh, frame gets joined together with the adjoining frame. Um, and they also have to be pieces that fit onto a, a standard truck bed. So nine by 48 feet, those were the trailer beds. Uh, they were a little bit oversized, but we had to also pre-engineer in the, in the two weeks that we had when we actually presented the design the proposal, we had to kind of already know the work with the structure engineer to sort of look at the feasibility of how we can break up the structure into pieces that would fit on the truck beds, uh, and we determined that the matching number was eight. Um, we did you know, a lot of three-dimensional 3D printing, a lot of 3D studies. This was our final uh, 3D, mo 3D model that we presented in our the presentation of the design uh, that uh, eventually won us to bid. We're demonstrating the different uses of the, the pavilion space and the roof. Um, some people might ask why the orange polycarbonate? Uh, well, because of the two walls, we recognize, you know, a lot of my memory as, uh, as a child crossing the border, going you know, from Los Angeles to visit family in Baja, we had, I always remember seeing the corrugated metal wall. Those are actually uh, tarmacs that were reused or recycled. Those were previously used as landing mats by the, the Gulf War. Uh, so they were repurposed to build the first that first uh, border wall. So we're reinterpreting it, sort of flipping the meaning on its head of the border wall, and uh, using a, pol a polycarbonate, uh, corrugated polycarbonate material, which is something that you can find at any hardware store you know, at Home Depot, to kind of mimic the corrugated metal of that old wall. And then the orange color was uh, in representation of World Design Capital's emblematic color. We had it have it custom made in that specific Pantone color uh, to be orange. So these were the kind of the use of wanting to use the democratic materials, the everyday materials that everyone can kind of recognize and know and, and, and instantly uh, know what they are. Uh, that lo fi approach to be sort of more approachable to people is what we were aiming for. I think that's also kind of part of that inspiration of Daniel's work where it was very kind of you know, metal stud and just this very simple material using a, you know, Creating the extraordinary again out of that ordinary material, so we, you know, we found you know, the steel, uh, this corrugated roofing material that's you know very typically found. Uh, we initially presented it in yellow because that's what they had available at you know, Home Depot. But, you know, that was the only interesting color we could find. Um, and so, the funny story when we when we presented it, you know, there was a positive reaction, but then they wanted to have a call with us about it, and they're like. You know, we didn't know whether we weren't sure if they liked it or not. And you know, one of the kids said, Oh, we love the design. We really think you guys did a really good job of you know, representing the region. Um, but we have one request, and we're like, What is that? He said, We can't have the, the pavilion be yellow because that was the World Design Capital logo in 2022 in Valencia. And we had, you know, 
15 people working on selecting a color for San Diego in the days, and they said they selected, they said that the color for San Diego should be orange. San Diego to one San Diego should be orange. And so we're like, yeah, we'll make it orange. <laughs> <laughs> it had to be a custom color, so yeah, that, that we, we could not find uh, off the shelf, so we, we had to uh, make that, have that fabricated in China. That was something that was, uh, that was the only thing that was this is a DMP Steel's factory in Tijuana. I really think we want to highlight that our partner DMP Steel in this in this project and, and in a lot of other uh, potential projects for us in the future because it's a company that they actually have two companies. They have their entity in California as a licensed steel subcontractor, so they can not only fabricate in Mexico but they can also erect their own work. And then they have another business entity in Mexico, and that company does strictly all the fabrication, all the welding, um, and they've had, it's a family business, they've been in, in business for at least three generations, uh, passed down from, from father to son and, and, and the next son. Um, and this is how uh, they had to completely assemble it from the ground up in the factory, in their eight respective frames. I'm not sure if I... Um, And it was really interesting because we had actually uh, our electrical engineer, uh, electrician who was going to install all the lights and the electrical work in the balloon came down to Tijuana on a day trip to help coordinate every single location of all the lights to pre-drill holes to be able to uh, hide all the electrical wiring within the structure. So they pulled all the wiring through all of the uh, tube steel and had to coordinate how we're going to run everything so that we can actually pull the structure apart and it wouldn't completely destroy all the wiring. So it had to be very, very well thought ahead of time. And it was just, it was very critical for them to be down there. And, and uh, it produced, you know, a very clean uh, uh, effect after, after the installation, you know, and nobody really notices all the electrical wiring. They're also uh, making these prefabricated modules for housing. Uh, and so when we were down there with the electrical engineer, there was a group of developers from Connecticut, actually, and they were, uh, they're working on a uh, student housing project in San Luis Obispo, and so they're they're fabricating these big frames, which would be living units for the students down there, and then they'll be shipped up to San Luis Obispo. But there you can see, you know, loading it on the truck. Obviously, the complexity of this being this irregular shape, so we had to make these custom jigs to support it, you know, and tie it down uh, because it doesn't lay flat, uh, and so and plus. You know, having a pilot car inside and maybe see this this display that we talked about, this show of, of you know this this mangled structure uh, making its way down and into Balboa Park. It was quite a sight uh, because you know, it's, it's just such a contrast, right? This very kind of futuristic you know, looking structure surrounded by this historical district. This is Matt Mangano, our structural engineer. Really great to work with. Um, and he, he collaborated with us since the very beginning, since we were actually even in the competition phase. As we said, you know, this we had to develop this entire concept in two weeks, including, you know, looking at the budget, making sure it was feasible structurally. You know, we when we first sketched this out, we actually didn't know if it would stand up. We were kind of questioning it ourselves. But he said, no, yeah, it, it should work. You know, all the, if you look at it, it's actually four quadrants that are leaning on each other, creating sort of a basic, of the basic elements of an arch. And the beautiful thing about it is that they all need each other in order to stand up and work, which was um, very disrepresentative of us even as a team. We need each other to work. We need each other on both sides of the border. And it, it kind of gets me. And Diego Tijuana needs each other to work as well, so that was a, a, a beautiful thought with that. These are some of the different views, and again, as Barbara mentioned, it kind of takes on its own personality. It looks different in every angle. There you can start to see some of the furniture that, that uh, we worked with by block to design this, these benches and stools that would also be, uh, you know, work as a, a accessibility measure so people don't hit their head on the 
on the annual portion, but also you know function as a school um, on the benches, obviously for for events. There, 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 they had to be. There was a concern of when we were thinking about what to put in it. There was a lot of concern about theft, and so we found you know that these blocks would be a great fit because they're, they're quite heavy. These benches you can't move without two dollars, uh, and the stools themselves are about a hundred pounds, so they're quite difficult to move around. Yeah, the ticker tape, another thing that we thought about uh, in, the, in the beginning with the World Design Capital, there was a lot of time about human-centered design. And we were trying to figure out a way to kind of make it interactive. Um, and so we looked at the exchange houses uh, along the border. There's, you know, the pins of the dollar conversion rates, those, those signs of display that display that. And we're like, well, what a great idea if we could bring that in, you know, incorporate that. But instead of showing the exchange rates, we could invite poets and writers on both sides of the border to submit uh, text to be displayed on the, on the pavilion. We received hundreds of entries and uh, you know, they were reviewed and, 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 and selected and, uh, and that's what's displayed now on the, on the pavilion. Yeah, so this exchange of ideas and, and culture uh, was how we were able to make this a more interactive pavilion uh, where the users themselves can provide uh, and an input, we provide an input into the, the actual end result of the pavilion. It's something that we can keep updating and reprogram and just change the file out as often as we'd like. And it displays not just poetry, but even personal stories and anecdotes and some sort of, some are in haiku format and some are more in like short essay format, but they alternate between Spanish and English. And so someone that's standing in front of the pavilion can sit down and it's, uh, you know, they can, um, anyone can read what's, what's being displayed uh, and it runs actually all day and all night, um, unintentionally actually, but uh, at night as dusk uh, approaches and the sun starts to set, the lights start to begin to come to life. Um, we program them to, um, so, you know, it starts to kind of twinkle a little bit and uh, it has another sort of life in, at night. So we realized um, when we were in the construction and we had a few late nights there to try to uh, get to the opening, we realized there are a lot of there's a lot of activity at night that nobody. I mean, I didn't actually know of. There are groups of people that just come to dance and uh, practice in front of you know the Timpkin Steps, or there are people that you know make their own music or just kind of hang out and informally. Just, it's very strange, you know. There's a second life in the park. I just thought about when we took the fence down, like right that it was. Uh, I think Wednesday was the mayor was showing up Wednesday morning to cut the ribbon. We were there, you know, Tuesday night, we took the fence down at 9 p.m. Literally 50 minutes after we took the fence down, a group of like three people showed up with a camera and we filmed a music video around the pavilion. One guy showed up with a keyboard and it was just like, <laughs> so interesting to see. Uh, and so yeah, it's, it's been fascinating to see how, how it activated the plaza and, you know, in the beginning when we pitched it to World Design Capital, we, you know, we talked about how, you know, when we think about San Diego for fun, I mean, the first thing we, it's not the first thing you think about, but it's design, right? You, maybe you think about Milan for the fashion, Paris, maybe you think of Berlin for the graphic design, maybe you think of Rotterdam for the architecture, but this was our attempt to kind of really plant the seeds and really you know, put us on the map because World Design Capital is about you know, highlighting cities that are about to take a step up and, uh, and, and, and really uh, you know, uh, level up on, on the design world and, and, and some other aspects. And so uh, we were really trying to uh, Plant the seeds for, 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 for the harvest to come in the future. What will this go after this? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, we actually don't know yet. It's been a question that we've been, um, you know, we knew that it was. The original goal was always for it to be a huge city. So after San Diego, we would hopefully go to Tijuana. Um, it's still, you know, because the, the elections were just earlier this, this summer, there's a whole change in government, not just the national government, but on all levels, down to the local municipal government. So it was, uh, we actually rescheduled it to be installed first in San Diego, and then later, you know, once their, all of their staff and, and the government got settled in, then we could re-approach them to see if we can 
uh, we sell it down there and talk to different organizations. But um, the hope is, you know, eventually I could go to Tijuana um, and be able to send me permanent down there. It might, yeah, it could be permanent anywhere. And most likely we'll stay in San Diego. San Diego has, uh, they, 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 they really want to keep it somewhere. So It'd there's lots like of in front of the loop. There's talks about there's talks about moving it to a park, uh, you, know, you know, maybe one of the schools, the UCSD. Uh, there's interest from from museums in the north outside of San Diego too. So we don't want to you know disclose too much, but yeah, there, there's museums that are interested in keeping it, uh, but that would be outside of San Diego, and, and I think San Diego wants to find a place right here. Um, because it's pretty big. Um, could be part of the Stewart collection at UCSD. Yeah. There's so many possibilities. There, as we know, World Design Capital has been you know, talking to many folks, and um, you know, we, we just know like this is this, this structure is because of the way it's fabricated and built, it could easily end up not with all of us, uh, just because it's, it's made out of steel. And we hope that it does find a permanent home somewhere, just because um, we know that you know, some of the past buildings you know have not been able to successfully end up somewhere permanently, um, but that's our hope. World Design Capital. Yeah, we designed it with the idea of it having a second life. That was part of the RFP. They were like, maybe we consider it having a second life. And so that's, you know, we thought it was a shame to take that budget and, you know, do this, really end up with this assembly and just, you know, end up in a dump site or recycle. We wanted it to, to really, you know, have a second life and, and be a, you know, a, a reminder or a memory of, of what was what was like. Yeah, could, could you back up and Clarify what was done in China. You were talking about the color of the pavilion. Is it the exterior cladding? This is that origin. What is that made from? Yes. So originally our, our idea was we wanted to always use a corrugated cor cor polycarbonate siding, which you see at Home Depot, and it's what people use you know, to build sheds and, and, and shade structures and greenhouses. And the only color colored polycarbonate you can really find normally is yellow, other than uh, you know, gray and white and, and clear. After we were selected and we were told we won, you know, we were asked to make it orange instead. So you don't really, you can't really find anything uh, of that color or specialty colors. Any manufacturer or provider that we would approach, they had to special order it. And all color carbon essentially comes from China, uh, or at least the majority of it does. Um, you know, you know, it can come from other com uh, other countries, but in order to get it that special color, that was the only item that we. We had to get um, overseas to get into that specific color, and we ordered, you know, just to have a little bit more than what we would think we need, just in case uh, we need to replace a panel in the future. Uh, and so that was everything else was uh, local and um, you know, fabricated here with materials from here. The buy block is uh, the buy blocks themselves. This company out of Los Angeles, and they take basically trash from all of LA County. They shred it up and just compress it with sheer pressure. There's no glues or adhesives, and it's just put together just because of the, kind of melts all the plastics a little bit together to create one solid block. And you can even see like the nutrition labels on it if you look closely. And um, so we try to really, you know, keep everything as local as possible. So what's the lifespan on the, the cladding? Uh, the cladding would be the same, you know, same as any other polycarbonate. It could probably be, you know, last at least 10 years. Um, you know, it doesn't really, Break down that easily. Uh, it's UV rated. It's UV resistant. So it's it's a roofing material. This is actually meant to be used outdoors for sheds. Um, but in its second life, you know, we could see the bones being basically used as a skeleton, and it could be recut with anything. Really, you know, it doesn't have to be orange or design capital. Everything is just this sort of skeleton to allow anything to really go on it. Ticker tape was also, uh, you know, quite a challenge because to, to have ticker tape that would twist and bend like this was really hard to find. Uh, when we got it quoted custom made, it was the whole budget, more than our whole budget to build this thing. So we're like, we were about to give up on the ticker tape. We're like, oh, what a shame! You know, we, we really wanted to have this opportunity to invite the community to submit and have these poems on on there. And yet, we actually we had to look outside of the construction industry and the design industry, and we went to we. we Looked at Hollywood. Um, Barbara's cousin is a set designer, and we just asked her, like, "Hey, have you seen anything that bends like this? Because it's hard to find, you know, screens that would bend like that." And she said, "Oh yeah, we need to talk to Fuse. Uh, they, you know, they, they have this 
flexible uh, uh, LED paneling that that, uh, that is used on, on all these concerts and shows, and so that's what's quite on there now. Yeah, this is where the only way we could get it to curve is it's already a flexible material, um, and just by creating by multiplying all this tile, we're able to kind of create that curving effect. So this is one interesting thing is that we look outside of the architectural and construction industry. There is a lot of architectural lighting that does this, but it's meant to be permanent and maybe custom made. Uh, it was uh, interesting to be to look outside and kind of be creative and think outside the box to find the solutions to create this. Uh, but it was something that you know it would be when we initially submitted the proposal. We did not have any idea how it actually would happen. We just had this trust and this faith that we would find a way. We actually we found a product in Amazon that was, you know, but it was like, you know, two feet long. Like, well, but should we should they find a whole roll of this stuff and we'll be able to make it work? We had two weeks to come up with it, so we're like, all right. So we showed it that, and they're like, okay, yeah, sure, it'll work. Okay. But no, yeah, when we really got into it, we found that this was going to be really expensive. Were there some other things? Well, now we designed this. Maybe we'll, we'll be able to design some other people some other things, but I mean, this was a lot of fun for us. We were, we really, you know, pushed our design thinking as designers. Uh, not only, uh, I mean, this is something that we would dream of doing in school, you know. This type of project, that's what we would, you know, present on our, you know, it's, it was almost like a thesis for us all over again. And the idea is, you know, working with an artist that gives a lot of feedback, it's kind of like having a thesis advisor. And it was just such a, you know, his, his knowledge about the and his work being so border focused. Um, you know, a lot of his work speaks to that about the, the, con the kind of conflicts, the uh, dynamics of being on the border. Um, he had a lot of really, really great input in terms of the concept. Um, so that really, really just pushed us as designers. And then to be able to fabricate it, uh, it was just a whole 360, you know, to be able to make something happen. Not only, you know, dream up of dream up these wild and crazy forms, but you know, in, in putting into practice and building it, um, I think that's what we all aspire to be learning for school, creating these things at the end of the day.